United States through her Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on her recent African tour uh, said to Nigeria's President Goodluck Jonathan, and I quote her, now the most important task that you face is making sure that there are better opportunities for all Nigerians, every young boy and girl, to have chances to fulfill God-given potentials, end of quote. Now. What does all that mean to the average Nigerian? Well, hello and welcome. This is 60 Minutes with me, Angela Jitumobi, and I thank you for joining me on the program today. My host, born in Medford, Oregon, uh, he attended the University of Oregon, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in European history, French language, and literature. Now, as a Rotary Foundation graduate fellow, he studied political science at the Université de Haute-Bretagne in Rennes, France. He also attended the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He's fluent in French and is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service with the rank of Minister Counselor. He joined the Foreign Service of the United States in 1985. He started his career in Niger Republic, followed by uh, assignments in South Africa and Chad. In 1993, he returned to Washington, D.C. and worked on Central African Affairs for the next two years. At various times, he has been Deputy Chief of Mission at the United States Embassies in Togo, Senegal, and Tunisia. He was United States Consul in Mumbai, India, and from 2004 to 2005, he oversaw the reconstruction of Iraq after the uh, Iraq war, and that he did from the State Department in Washington, D.C. He was U United States Ambassador to the Republic of Mali. That's between 2005 to 2008. In 2008, he became the Deputy Chief of Mission uh, at the United States Embassy in Copenhagen, Denmark. That's uh, two years. He did that 2008 to 2010. And that brings us to 2010 when he was appointed as the United States Ambassador to Nigeria, a post he currently holds. So, join me after the break. I'm spending 60 minutes today with Terence McCauley. He's the United States Ambassador to Nigeria. Welcome back. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Bienvenue, Mr. Ambassador. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I wanted us to start from the Secretary of State's African tour. Mm. Uh, recently, during her July African tour, she said, and I'm quoting her now, we intend to remain very supportive of your reform efforts. We want to work with you and we will be by your side as you make the reforms and take the tough decisions that are necessary, end of quote. Mm. So what are the top decisions that the United States considers necessary for Nigeria, um, that Nigeria must take? Absolutely. Thanks, uh, Angela. Uh, indeed, uh, the Secretary of State was very clear when she met with President Jonathan and his leadership team that the United States considers Nigeria to be one of its most important strategic partners on the African continent. Clearly, going forward, uh, the United States is looking for continued progress on democracy and governance. Nigeria had arguably its best election since the return to democracy last year in 2011. Yeah. We'd like to see Nigeria build on that to uh, improve electoral systems uh, going forward so that 2015 is even better. We'd like to see a, a commitment to uh, the, the fight against corruption. Uh, we'd like to see a, a more enabling environment for uh, foreign investment because I think that there are significant yeah. sectors of the American private sector who would like to come and invest in Nigeria. They want to see uh, accountability, transparency, sanctity of contracts. Uh, so going forward across the board, uh, we want to be supportive of this transformation agenda. We'd like to see concrete results uh, which will indicate that, uh, that government is making progress. Okay. So um, the U.S. security strategy now with the socioeconomic plan, especially for the North, uh, the United States says it's setting up an open consulate to uh, reach northern Nigerians. Uh, does the United States feel a need for that because there is none at the moment and because you think um, we're not in, going in the right direction 
um, as far as taking care of security is concerned. Look, there are 80 million Nigerians who live in the north. It's an important part of this great country, and we believe that establishing a con consulate in Kano in the long term, um, it's not going to happen tomorrow, it's not going to happen next year, but over the next couple of years we hope to have a presence in Kano, yeah. because, because we, we, need, we need outreach in this very important part of the country. With regard to security, clearly uh, the insurgency that's going on in northern Nigeria affects the daily lives of, of millions of Nigerians. Uh, we believe that government needs to address the security problem, but more broadly, our view is that government should take a holistic approach to insecurity in the north, that it needs to be uh, an approach which, which focuses on, uh, on the perpetrators of, of these horrible acts mm -hmm. in a way that does not injure innocent civilians, does not create collateral damage, that respects the human rights of persons living in the North. At the same time, government needs to communicate a development strategy for the North that addresses some of the underlying grievances. Now, I'm not saying poverty causes extremism, yes. but certainly unemployment, um, uh, lack of opportunity, create Re potential recruits for extremist groups. And so we believe government across the board needs to look at, at development in the North. Because if you look at any social economic indicator, whether it's education or public health, uh, roads, power, uh, the north part of this great country is one of the most underserved regions. Okay, and, and it's interesting you talk about collateral damage. Mm. Um, because um, a lot of people are opposed to the United States branding um, the Boko Haram group as a terrorist organization, they say that one of the reasons why is once it's branded, then uh, we're looking at um, drones coming in and, and causing attacking people that the United States considers to be the leaders of the Boko Haram group, therefore um, causing collateral damage as well to people who have, uh, innocent people who have no business at all with the group. So th there's no question that the United States is going to get involved in, in the way that you've just described, Angela, nor are we planning on, on, on putting uh, U.S. military on the ground in, in, in northern Nigeria. This is a Nigerian problem. Nigeria is an important partner for us. We want to support Nigeria's efforts to find a Nigerian solution to this dramatic problem. With regard to the uh, designation, uh, we have not designated Boko Haram as a foreign terrorist organization. Certainly that discussion continues, although we don't comment on, the, on, on that process. Um, but we, we identified three individuals who are leaders of the group. Uh, who have advocated violent acts, who have advocated uh, violent acts against, uh, against U.S. interests, and we believe that that, that highlights the, uh, the, the importance of, of this issue. Okay. So, um, uh, what, what criteria does the United States consider to brand anyone a terrorist individual or terrorist organization? It's a complicated procedure, Angela, and we really don't comment on the dis internal discussions on this issue, but Broadly, you, you look at issues of, of, uh, of lethality, of, uh, of, uh, of threats to uh, U.S. persons or U.S. national interests, uh, and uh, we very much have a, have a debate within, uh, within our, our government on this issue, uh, and we arrive at, at a designation. Okay. All right. So can I connect the strategy now that the U.S. is hoping to put in the North? with Mrs. Clinton's words again in July, where mm. she said that the most important task that we face is making sure that there are better opportunities for all Nigerians, every young boy and girl to have chances to fulfill God-given potential. Is the absence of better opportunities, perhaps, a factor that Nigeria is ignoring uh, in this fight uh, for a more secure environment? I think it's without question that uh, Insecurity in the north inhibits economic development. Yes. There are enormous opportunities uh, across Nigeria in the agricultural sector. Uh, and in fact, in, uh, in Taraba State, in Kwara State, we're seeing uh, dramatic uh, actions by, by governors, by government to uh, attract foreign investment. The type of insecurity that we're seeing in Bornu State, in, in Kano, uh, in, in Bauchi, uh, I think risks damaging the brand of Nigeria internationally uh, by. Uh, giving an impression that this is not a place that, uh, that, that uh, foreign investment is possible or, in, in fact, is welcome. And I think that's very much at odds with the truth. I think there's, there's enormous potential in this country. Um, and so I, I think government needs to address the insurgency, needs to restore order, needs to restore peace, needs to give confidence both to 
populations in the north and in the south, but it has a strategy and it intends going forward to look at the security and, and look at how government's transformation agenda can really improve the daily lives of people living in these states that are affected by the insurgency. Okay. All right. So um, the United States, you said, designated three leaders of Boko Haram as terrorists. Um, what would be the effect of that on Nigerians? There is a genuine fear now that Nigerians traveling to the United States will be harassed by the United States um, Immigration Service. Is that a real fear? I don't believe that's a, that's a legitimate fear, Angela. We certainly support legitimate travel of Nigerians to the United States. Uh, obviously, Nigerians need to comply with, with U.S. law and, and regulations, but there is no question that, uh, that United States uh, Immigration Services are, are going to particularly profile an individual group or, or country because of, of this designation. Okay. So um, with, with the radical Islamic position and, of the group, um, persecution of people of all tribes, cutting across all tribes and all religions, what next does the United States need to, to you know, justify or to designate that group as a terrorist group? Angela, that's a complicated, uh, it's a complicated question. Um, I think that fundamentally uh, it's, a, it's a Nigerian issue. Um, I think that, that government has identified uh, the threat that the insurgency presents. Uh, I think it's taking steps to, aggress it, to address it from a, a security perspective. Um, we believe that it needs to do more in, in terms of strategic communications to northern populations uh, because we believe that, that this is a an ideology which is very much at odds with uh, the vast majority of Nigerians, uh, certainly Nigerians living in the north. And, and therefore, uh, if government can make progress on this across-the-board strategy to address the, the insurgency, uh, we believe it can be, uh, it can be contained. And, uh, and we believe then that, that there can be great uh, potential for economic progress in the north. All right. We'll take our first break now. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with the United States Ambassador Terence McCauley. <music> Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching 60 Minutes with me, Angela Jitomobi, and I've got the United States Ambassador Terence McCauley on the hot seat today. Okay, and as much as we like to say we're allies, Nigeria and the United States, we do differ on certain issues strongly too. For instance, can one's sexuality be a right, such as one that is or can be enforceable as a human right? Well, the United States has been very clear about that. President Obama and Secretary Clinton have made it very clear that uh, we as a government, we as a people, believe uh, in the fundamental rights of, of every human being. Uh, and I, I think you're referring to the, the debate over uh, LGBT, uh, lesbian, gays, uh, bisexual, transsexual. We believe that, that, that that this is a fundamental human right. We believe that, that groups which advocate for the rights of su such groups uh, ought to have freedom of expression as, as any other group in, any, uh, in a democratic society. So certainly it's, it's an important issue for the United States. It is. Now, the United States Secretary of State, again, while addressing the United Nations in Geneva, says in many ways they are an invisible minority. Those are her words. Nigeria says let them remain invisible. Isn't that a right Nigeria has as well to say we want them to remain invisible. And as, as long as you remain invisible, then you won't be criminalized. I think that uh, from our perspective, uh, the right of any individual uh, to advocate peacefully for a, a position um, is fundamental in a democratic society. And I think that's what uh, the United States has, has said on many occasions, President Obama, Secretary Clinton. Certainly there are cultural traditions at, at play and we respect that, but we believe that uh, the right of adults, uh, consenting adults to, to engage in behavior uh, should be respected. And that Nigeria has signed a number of human, international human rights conventions, uh, which we believe uh, 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 promote the rights of, of, uh, of LGBT individuals. Mm. And, and uh, the UK has, the United Kingdom has hinted that it may leverage aid uh, giving of aid to this matter, will the United States be following suit and withdrawing aid as well? We have not made that same, uh, th that same link. President Obama has issued a presidential memorandum where he has directed 
uh, the United States government and embassies over, uh, overseas to make uh, advocacy for the rights of LGBT individuals part of our bilateral dialogue. Certainly going forward, we're going to do that. We have done that at the National Assembly and with the, the federal government. Uh, we will continue to look for ways to support uh, groups that advocate for uh, for these uh, rights, mm -hmm. to support them, because we believe that that is a fundamental part of freedom of expression in a democratic society. But we have not made that link to, uh, to development assistance. Now, let's talk about the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. AGOA signed into law May 18, 2000. Uh, it offers tangible incentives for African countries to continue their efforts to open their economies and build free markets. The act is supposed to significantly enhance United States market access for 40 sub-Saharan countries presently. Has that number increased from 40? Uh, we've seen a significant uh, increase in interest uh, uh, benefiting from uh, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA. Mm -hmm. uh, it is one of the most liberal trade regimes that's ever been offered to a particular region, and we've been encouraged over the last 10 years of yes. African countries taking advantage of AGOA. Uh, we hope that it's going to be extended uh, another 10 years. Secretary Clinton and President Obama are certainly very uh, strong in, strongly in favor of that. Yeah. With regard to Nigeria, uh, we have not been... Uh, we, we have not seen Nigeria take as much advantage of AGOA as we had hoped, frankly. Why, why do you think that is? Well, 99.65% of Nigeria's exports to the United States are, are crude oil. Mm -hmm. uh, only 0.35% for every, everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that to some extent it is uh, understanding the market, uh, taking advantage of, of opportunities. Um, and to some extent, it's because of the fact that you have this enormous internal market. You have a market of 160 million people. Nigeria, yes. we certainly welcome Nigeria increasing its exports to the United States, but you have enormous potential yes. for creating a manufacturing base here in Nigeria and catering to your own internal market and, indeed, the, the larger ECOWAS market. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and the extension, it, it was originally for eight years, from October 2000 to September 2008. It's been extended to 2015. Mm -hmm. Why did the United States feel the need for that? Well, because we've seen uh, African economies grow. Uh, we've seen uh, increasing diversica diversification in, in African markets, and we've seen increasing desire to export to one of the largest uh, markets in the world. And so uh, we see it as a, as a positive force in our economic engagement in Africa uh, because improved trade uh, improves ties. Mm -hmm. Okay. And AGOA expands the duty-free access of about 7,000 product tariff lines mm -hmm. to the United States market. What factors affect trade patterns of selected industries? Well, that's, uh, that's a complex question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, for the most part, African countries that have that have taken advantage of uh, Goa have looked at uh, looked at finished textiles. Mm -hmm. uh, they've looked at uh, artisanal products. Uh, they've looked at agricultural products uh, that uh, where they're able to meet the strict phytosanitary regulations of the United States. So it's a very diverse picture, depending on the, uh, the competitive advantage that, it, that it, uh, any particular country enjoys. Okay, and and the United States said that they're hoping to. Uh, support us, especially in the areas of agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, how will that tie in now to AGOA? Well, again, you have a huge internal market, uh, but we certainly welcome um, uh, additions to the value chain in, the, in agricultural products and potentially exports to the United States. But what we're what we're looking at is is how we can uh, how we can help Nigeria uh, with the agricultural part of its transformation mm -hmm. agenda. Uh, you have, I think, 80 million hectares of arable land. Uh, you have a significant part of your population, part of your GDP that is engaged in agriculture, and, and yet it's principally subsistence agriculture. Yeah. So there are enormous potentials in rice production, in cotton production, mm -hmm. uh, in cassava production mm -hmm. to, uh, to create jobs, to uh, create uh, create and improve Nigeria's food self-sufficiency to, pro to uh, provide food for the internal market and ultimately to export. Yes, but one of the challenges will be education. Um, you've talked about all the potentials. Mm. Uh, most of the people you talk about uh, don't see that potential in agriculture. How can we change 
the mindset of the average unemployed youth, for instance, to consider uh, agriculture as um, a veritable uh, career choice? I think if you look at examples around this country where agribusiness is succeeding, uh, your Minister of Agriculture has talked about the need to change the mindset of agriculture from a development project to a business. I think that's absolutely uh, on target. And if you look, take an example where this has worked in Taraba State. Yes. Uh, the governor in cooperation with the federal government and in cooperation with a U.S. investor has designated I think 43,000 hectares for uh, rice production, for uh, eventually aquaculture. Uh, the American investor brought 1,500 young Nigerians to his training facility in Kenya. Mm -hmm. They're going to return to cultivate their own land. And I, I think that that kind of example yes. where you're, you've got either domestic or international investors who are willing to invest the capital and in training, uh, who can uh, cultivate the land, produce uh, a product, rice, which uh, is very much in demand here in, in Nigeria, can demonstrate to young people that really they can make a living, they can provide for their families, they can educate their children yes. by engaging in this agriculture as a business. Mm. All right, take a second break now. Join us again after the break. I want us to come back to security now because that's one of the areas the United States is also hoping to support um, Nigeria, you know, in, in security. Um, how will the United States, United States juxtapose this? Uh, the need to help us, uh, our need to have you help us, and the thought uh, by some Nigerians, that some Nigerians have that it's interference in our internal business when you you seek to help us in our security challenges uh, look Angela for the United States uh, throughout Africa indeed throughout the world we look at this as a partnership uh, we look at this as a partnership where the United States with its uh, variety of military to military programs mm -hmm. is meeting needs which partner countries in this case Nigeria have identified as areas where we can add value to their national security objectives. Let me give you an example on maritime security. Yes. We have a very robust relationship with the Nigerian Navy. We've worked with the Special Boat Service. We have a visit of a U.S. ship right, uh, now. right now, which is working with the Nigerian Navy on some medical programs, delivering um, um, uh, eye exams and, and medical care uh, to people in the, in, the, in the Lagos area because that's what the Nigerian Navy has, has identified as a, as a gap, as an area where they would like to improve their capacity. Um, so it's a very much a question of, of our partners identifying areas where the United States can add value and the United States presenting programs mm -hmm. where we believe uh, can meet that, that need. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a partnership. Okay, without actually loading it over your partners? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, this is being driven our, our military to military relationship is, yes. is very much driven by uh, President Jonathan and his national security team. Mm -hmm. uh, we look, and, and as part of our dialogue on, on security issues, uh, we very much make clear that we are responding to what the Nigerians have identified as priorities, mm -hmm. areas where the Nigerians would like us to help them build what they have identified as a, as a gap. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we come to uh, democracy because we like to say in Nigeria that we're building our democracy on the United States model so should countries have the liberty to color what they call democracy with their own peculiar idiosyncrasies I don't think that there is one formula for okay. democracy I, I think one of the things that I found so encouraging over the 27 years that I've worked in, in on the African continent is yeah. the growth of democratic institutions across the continent. Democracies grow in different ways according to their own indigenous, cultural, political, social, ec economic traditions. There is no one formula yeah. for democracy. I mean, there, there are certain fundamental things which I think we all agree on. Yeah. Freedom of speech, yeah. freedom of association, 
freedom of religion, um, the right of, of people to democratically change their government. I think those are, 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 the, are basics. the basic principles of democracy, but democracies evolve in very different ways. Okay, and so we both agree about that. And uh, can you then tell us what the U United States Constitution says, for instance, does it require a public declaration of assets by the United States President, or is it left to his discretion to decide whether to make it public or keep it private? The Constitution, I, I believe, is silent. I'm not a constitutional scholar like okay. my president, uh, but I, I believe the, constitu uh, the Constitution is silent on this issue. However, as part of uh, the uh, evolution of the U.S. system over the years, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there is a public declaration of, of of assets. Every federal official, including me, mm -hmm. uh, every year has to declare assets which are part of the public domain. Okay, so it's a public document that can be accessed by anyone. That's right. Okay, and um, how does public declaration affect anything? What will it achieve, for instance, in the absence of parameters that can determine whether um, the, the declaration giving has been truthful and not compromised? Well, there is a, in, in our system, uh, yes. there is a, a review process. Uh, various officials, uh, including ethics lawyers at the State Department, have a look at my declaration of assets. A similar process goes, is, is undertaken for any federal official in a, in a senior position yeah. to, uh, to uh, attest to the validity of the de declaration. I think the declaration of assets is important because it, it eliminates concerns about conflict of interests. Mm -hmm. uh, it demonstrates uh, on a regular basis, whether uh, an official has a suspicious increase in income. Yes. Uh, so I, I think it's an important part of the democratic process for the United States yes. uh, to to uh, build trust in institutions and in individuals. Okay. So would you would you then say that the United States thinks um, that? Uh, the, the war against anything, really, be it corruption or, or, or terrorism, would, would work better if we had stronger institutions and not relying on uh, individuals, perhaps. I don't know if you, you, you got the drift of that question. Well, uh, President Obama was very clear in the, the historic speech he gave in Accra in 2009 that the United States believes that Africa needs strong institutions, not mm. strong men. Yes. Um, inst the construction of, of, of democratic institutions are, are fundamental to the construction of, uh, of democracy. Uh, your legal institutions, your anti-corruption institutions, your electoral institutions, uh, institutions like the National Assembly or in the United States Senate and, and House of Representatives, these are, are fundamental building blocks of a successful democracy. Okay, so would you say that the institutions help to prevent, for instance, corruption from happening because they are strong? I think strong institutions uh, and effective oversight of those institutions mm -hmm. is important to the fight against corruption, mm -hmm. uh, important for the success of, uh, of, of, of elections. Mm -hmm. uh, so INEC is important to the, uh, the success of Nigeria's electoral process, just okay. as EFCC and other anti-corruption institutions are, are important to the fight against corruption. Well, let's talk about gun control. We've seen certain incidents in the United States um, in the last couple of months. It's brought to the fore the debate about gun control. Will there be any major changes to that? You know, Angela, that's a, that's a very difficult question, and it's a question which uh, we've been battling as a society for a number of years. I think reasonable people can disagree on the need for greater gun control. We saw after the assassination attempt on President Reagan, uh, the Brady Bill was passed, increasing oversight of uh, the registration process. I think any of these horrific incidents call upon reasonable people to reevaluate whether our existing legislation is strong enough. Um, for the most part, it, it, it's been a matter that has been left to the states. Um, I think that you'll see a lot of soul searching because of some of these horrific inc incidents. And, whether you see action at the federal level, I, I don't know. We're in an election year. Mm. It's not yet part of the, the election debate, but perhaps with the new Congress. Okay. You think it will be a major factor in determining how the election goes in November? I, I don't think so. I, I think most Americans are really intensely focused on the economy. And uh, as we've seen over the last couple of months, uh, that has really been the focus of the debate between the two candidates. Mm. Okay. 
Now, let's talk about um, U.S. visa um, laws. It's often said that the United States has a quota system. I don't know if you've heard that. A lot of people out here believe that there is a certain number of visas uh, the embassy gives out every day and they mustn't exceed that number. Would that be a true fact? That is absolutely not true, Angela. Yeah. It's absolutely not true. Uh, we have no quota system for uh, non-immigrant visas and the goal of uh, U.S. visa law and re regulation is to facilitate the legitimate travel of, of students, of business people, of tourists to the United States, whether they come from Nigeria or from uh, any other country. Yeah. Um, we are constrained in the number of, of visa cases that we can adjudicate per day because of the intense increase in demand here in, in Nigeria. I think it's increased 67 percent uh, over the last couple of years. We have limited physical plant uh, in terms of interview window, mm -hmm. windows and number of consular officers and so certainly we're limited in the number of interviews we can do each day because I can't have my consular officers interviewing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. Uh, but to the greatest extent possible, we accommodate as many people as we can per day. Okay, so um, when you say legitimate travel, legitimate immigrants, what factors would um, make me legitimate, for instance? Well, let's make a distinction between immigrants and non-immigrants okay. uh, because the vast majority of Nigerians uh, wish to go to the United States for study or for business or for tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there is a basic criterion uh, of, and it's fundamental to our, our visa legislation and that is do you have ties to your home country and how do you demonstrate ties? You demonstrate ties by family ties, by uh, having a job, by having property, mm -hmm. having business interests that would bring you back to your home country. Okay. And that's the fundamental criterion that consular officers use, whether it's, it's Angela coming from Nigeria mm -hmm. or um, uh, uh, someone else coming from, from, uh, from Mali or yeah. f uh, Abdul coming from Senegal. Yeah, so, so you, you must have legitimate ties here to make you want to come back home. That's correct. Is there a genuine fear that most Nigerians don't want to come back home? No, no, not at all. No, yeah. not, not at all. I, I, I think, in, in fact, in the two years that I've been in Nigeria, uh, I've been very impressed with the pride that Nigerians take in their country. Mm -hmm. uh, legitimate pride, I think. It's yeah. a great country. Yeah. And you talked about a 67% increase. Why do you think the numbers are so many, numbers of people wanting to go to the United States? We'd like to think it's because you want to come in uh, and shop in New York uh, or you want to go to Disneyland or you want to uh, add enormous value to our, our public and private university system. And by the way, the Nigerian students are the largest population in the United States from Sub-Saharan Africa. Over 6,000 Nigerian students are studying in the United States. We welcome uh, those kind of exchanges. Mm. And I was wondering then, if 6,000 are studying there, perhaps education would be another area that the United States can assist Nigeria with? Very much so. And in fact, as part of our USAID program, we do have a, uh, uh, an education program where we uh, are working with the Ministry of Ed Federal Ministry of Education. We're working at the state level to uh, improve curriculum for teacher training. Last year, uh, working with um, the federal government, we sponsored the National Education uh, Database Survey, which shows uh, throughout the country levels of literacy, distance from schools, uh, to help Nigeria um, uh, divide resources where the need is greatest. All right, we'll take our final break now. Join us again after the break. I want to present myself as an African. And I know, and I know, and I know, and I know, and I know what you like. I know, and I know, and I know, I know what you like. Everything you love, baby, you love, like, baby, you love, baby, you love, baby, you love. I know, and 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 I know, baby, you like, baby, you like, baby, you like, baby, you like, baby. Welcome back. My concluding moments now with the United States Ambassador to Nigeria, Terence McCauley. What other support would the United States be giving Nigerians in, in terms of education? Well, we have a, a very active program of, of exchange programs. Uh, the, uh, Is that at primary, secondary? Or it's tertiary, 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 tertiary really. Tertiary level. And, and, and our, our USAID program is, is focused on primary. It's, it's focused on primary? Yes. Okay. Why is that? 
Well, I, I think that uh, I'm not an education expert, but I think most experts agree that lifetime literacy and lifetime numeracy yes. means keeping kids in school through at least the, the sixth year. Mm. Uh, and so it's really important to focus your resources on primary education so that you can create a literate and numerate population, which then can compete for secondary, which can go on to uh, vocational or, uh, or, or colleges and universities to create the kind of literate and well-trained uh, population that is going to respond to economic opportunities, which we mm -hmm. hope are going to be created by uh, the President's transformation agenda. Transformation. You've talked about that transformation agenda. You've mentioned it about five times. Mm. Does the United States think that that agenda is uh, we're in the right place with that transformation agenda? I, I think there, it, there are laudable objectives to the transformation agenda. Uh, we're over a, a bit of a, a year plus and a few months into uh, the president's term. Clearly, we'd like to see progress, and I'm, I'm sure the Nigerians would like to see progress. We're seeing it in, in, in the ag sector. Uh, we've seen uh, progress in the power sector. Um, we believe health and education are important priorities as well, and so going forward, uh, it's a laudable set of goals. I think that Nigeria's international partners, and I think most Nigerians, mm. are, are looking for concrete progress across the board. Would you understand the cynicism of Nigerians, though? You, you're saying that um, you think the transformation is laudable. Do you think the cynicism is justified? I think it's natural for, for people to want change uh, to occur rapidly. Um, I think it's difficult uh, when people are living in very difficult conditions and, and millions of Nigerians live on less than a dollar a day. Um, I think it's, uh, it's understandable that people would be impatient and perhaps cynical. Uh, I think long-term progress uh, requires a long-term investment. And how does the United States see its role? Uh, a lot of people resent its role as um, a superpower, the most powerful country in the world. How does the United States react to that? Well, in the Nigerian context, we very much see ourselves as partners. Mm -hmm. uh, for the United States, Nigeria, as I think I stated at the outset, is our most important strategic partner in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we see this as a partnership. Let me give you an example. Uh, we have a $500 million PEPFAR program, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, working on HIV um, AIDS prevention, providing antiretrovirals to the three and a half million mm -hmm. Nigerians living with, uh, with HIV and AIDS. Yeah. We have established a partnership framework with the government of Nigeria, which going forward over the next few years, we'll see an increase in resources that Nigeria devotes mm -hmm. to uh, this very important public health issue. And so that's the kind of partnership we see across the board, whether we're looking at our security relationship, whether we're looking at the investments that we're making in public health or education, we're doing this in partnership. Uh, we are not imposing either our values or our programs. We are trying to uh, provide assistance in areas where Nigerians at the local, state, and federal level have identified as, as priorities. Well, but do you know that Nigerians think um, that you're trying to impose your ideas? I would hope that's not the case. <laughs> I would hope that's not the case, and, and I think the, these kinds of discussions yes. and, and, uh, and dialogues are, uh, are an important for us to send the message that we're doing this in partnership. We, yes. do, we do not seek to uh, impose. We see enormous opportunity here, obviously, for private uh, investment, including American investment. Um, but we, we see ourselves as, as partners. partners. Um, I, I know your, your role is as a diplomat. Um, you know, so, but I, I would like us to talk about the November elections mm -hmm. in, in, in the United States. Uh, whichever way it goes, does it matter to you as, a, as an ambassador to Nigeria, for instance, who wins? Will that change the foreign policy of the United States? I, I think historically um, there is, a, there is a, a phrase in the United States that, um, that partisan divisions stop at the water's edge, <laughs> that there is a remarkable consistency in American foreign policy. And I think over the last 15 years, mm -hmm. you've seen that, particularly with regard to United States policies uh, toward Africa, where you've seen programs like PEPFAR, mm -hmm. programs like the President's Malaria Initiative, which were started under, uh, under President Bush yes. which, or President Clinton, and which have been continued through successive administrations. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the United States is facing a very severe uh, economic crisis, just as many countries are throughout the world. My hope is that our development assistance portfolio will remain constant. 
I believe, uh, from what I've seen, uh, that our policies, uh, foreign policy, and that our policy certainly toward the African continent will remain consistent regardless of who wins the election in November. Now, I want us to talk about a few myths that exist about the relationship between Nigeria and um, um, uh, America. Okay. Um, do you, have you heard it said that um, the United States is waiting to designate Boko Haram as a terrorist organization only after the November elections? I have not heard that, and that is, that is certainly not true. Uh, this is a discussion which is ongoing within the United States government. Uh, I cannot predict when or if uh, such a designation will be made, but uh, there's certainly no timeline. No timeline. Okay. Have you also heard that um, people can be denied a visa just because they don't like their faces? I have not heard that, and I would wish to state categorically that that is <laughs> not the case. That. Uh, uh, my uh, my advice to my consular officers is that every applicant needs to be treated with uh, with dignity and, and respect. That oftentimes the individual may not qualify for a visa, but it's based upon objective criteria. Mm -hmm. Objective criteria. Okay. The third thing is um, people think that uh, this partnership you talk about and the friendship that we have is only because the United States is interested in our oil. Well, uh, Nigeria is America's fifth largest supplier of, uh, of crude oil, although that percentage is, is going down. It's an important part of the relationship, but it's not the only part of the relationship. We have a very diverse bilateral relationship, and we have uh, a deep partnership with Nigeria on a number of international issues, whether it's at the Human Rights Commission in Geneva, the UN Security Council. Uh, we have been so impressed with Nigeria's uh, work within ECOWAS on crises from Cote d'Ivoire to Guinea to Mali, uh, to the Libya crisis, the ongoing crisis in, in Syria. It is a very diverse and complex relationship, and it cannot be uh, boiled down to, to one single issue. We also have a, a number of exchange programs, uh, academic exchanges, cultural exchanges, which form an important part of the relationship. Okay. Um, the fourth thing is um, they also say that the, the reason you're assisting us so much with a lot of our sectors is because um, you don't want Nigerians to really come uh, to America. So if our government gets it right here, we'll <laughs> stay right here. <laughs> well, uh, I've got to say that uh, in the two, the two years that I've spent in Nigeria make me realize what a wonderful place this is. Uh, and I would think that um, as Nigeria develops economically, as economic opportunities are created for its youth, that you would find intense domestic investment in, in Nigeria and Niger Nigerians investing in, in themselves. But we welcome uh, Nigerians traveling to the United States. We welcome the diversity that Nigerians bring to our university system. Uh, we would like to see uh, more exports, Nigerian exports to the United States. And so uh, I think as Nigeria going forward uh, develops its economy, diversifies its economy, you're going to see a lot of uh, Nigerians who see opportunities here, mm -hmm. um, but who may also look for opportunities abroad. Okay. And you spent a lot of time in Africa, in Mali, t Togo, Senegal, Tunisia, mm -hmm. and now Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Do you eat any African food? I do. I do. You eat any Nigerian food? I love soya. Yeah, soya. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Soya. Yeah. 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 It's one of my favorite foods. One of your favorites, yeah. 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 Right. Pepper uh, soup, uh, I, can, I can take. Um, but but it's not I love. too hot. No, I love I love the spice actually. Really. Bring on the spice. <laughs> it's been great speaking with you, Mr. Ambassador. Well, just one more question mm. for those watching now, Nigerians watching who are interested in going to United States either on holiday, for education, for business. What is uh, the simplest advice that you can give? Plan well ahead because of the increasing demand for visas and the constraints we have in Abuja at the embassy and here in, in Lagos at the, at the Consulate General in terms of number of visa officers, we have a backlog. We're working to eliminate that backlog, but, and we will try to accommodate spur of the moment requests for legitimate reasons, yeah. but we really ask that, that Nigerians plan ahead, plan three months ahead, six months ahead, plan your travel mm. Uh, so that we can accommodate you, because there's a tremendous demand for visa interviews, which we simply can't accommodate. When you say three months ahead, mm. um, if, if you know when your trip 
is due, you should start applying for a visa three months before. That. You should absolutely apply for, uh, for an interview. Go online. We have an online system where you apply and, and get a date. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in Lagos, it's about 73 days yeah. until you can get a date. And in Abuja, the, the, um, the figure is, is a bit higher because we have fewer uh, consular officers in Abuja. Okay. So plan well ahead. Okay. Uh, are there still challenges about getting the appointments? Are there, are there uh, people blocking the lines that we used to have? Well, uh, those who have appointments will be admitted. Uh, I know that there are a number of touts who try to facilitate the visa process, mm -hmm. and I would encourage uh, your audience not to listen to them and to apply themselves. You don't need an intermediary. There is an online system. It's, it's uh, user-friendly. It's accessible. Use the online system. Get your appointment date and show up on that date. Does the United States have any recognized official touts that work with them? No, absolutely not whether it's for, uh, for the, uh, the so-called visa lottery or for non-immigrant visas. We do not work with intermediaries. Okay. We have a contractor that manages our appointment, online appointment system, yes. and that is the only interface that Nigerians need. Okay. And once you get through that interface, you will get a legitimate visa uh, through the, from the United States. You'll get a, a visa interview, interview. And, and you will then give, be allowed to demonstrate that your, your purpose is legitimate and if the uh, consular officer believes you qualify for a visa, you will get the visa, which is an application for admission to the United States. Okay. The immigration officer at the border is, is, the, is the final arbiter, but that visa gives you the right to apply for admission to the United and I'm States. I'm you said that because that was my last question. A lot of people assume that once they get the visa here, mm. um, it is unlimited access to get into the United States, but it doesn't work like that, does it? You, you need to explain yourself to the, uh, the immigration officer, just as I do when I return to the United States. He looks at my passport. Really? Sure, he looks at my passport and wants to know where I've been. I tell him. He you says, welcome home. Questions? Yeah, not, not too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so even when you get the visa here, be prepared to answer questions. Absolutely, there. absolutely. The, the visa is, is, is in fact, a, a, application, a, a right to apply for admission to the United States. Okay, so it, it doesn't mean that you will get in. For the most part, you will. Yeah, for, for the, the most, most part. part very will. rare cases are, are, are people turned away, turned back, turned away. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angela. Good for talking with you. Sixty minutes with me. All right. Well, that's it for this week. Um, it's been sixty minutes with the United States Ambassador Terence McCauley, uh, ex going through all the questions that you all send in to me. Uh, don't forget to join me same time, same day, same station. You never know who I'll be spending sixty minutes with. Of course. You can join me on Facebook, like 60 Minutes with Angela on Facebook, and follow me on Twitter, Angela at 60 Minutes. I'm Angela Ajitomobi, and I thank you for the pleasure of your company.